Okay, so one of the main advantages and disadvantages of the dividend growth model are as follows. So the advantage is that it's easy to understand. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to compute. Uh, the only disadvantage of using the dividend growth model in terms of computing the cost of equity is that not every company pays dividends. In fact, a lot of companies nowadays are not paying dividends, all right? They're, they're choosing to take the money that they earned and instead of paying it out to shareholders, they are retaining it and reinvesting. Okay, so uh, if the company's not paying dividends, you can't estimate dividends and therefore you can't estimate a share price or even the, the return on equity. Um, it's not applicable if the dividends aren't growing at a reasonably constant rate. Um, again, if a company is paying dividends, but you know the growth rate in the dividends is drastically changing year over year or quarter over quarter, then it's very difficult to come up with a reasonable estimate of the constant growth rate. Um, likewise, it's extremely sensitive to the growth rate, um, implying that a small increase in, in the growth rate might lead to a, a big increase in the cost of equity estimate. Um, and then finally, it does not explicitly consider risk um, because if we look at the equation, D1 over P0 plus G, what measure out there is, 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 is accounting for, for risk? Uh, is, dividends don't account for risk. Uh, the price of the stock does not account for the risk and the growth rate itself does not account for the risk. Um, there might be, these three measures might have some type of indirect link with risk, but they don't explicitly measure or consider risk. So that's one drawback. On the flip side, we do have the security market line. Um, and again, this is the cap M approach. And so what we can do is use the risk free rate, the market risk premium, as well as the systematic risk measure associated with the company's beta to come up with some measure of RE, again, the cost of equity. All right, so if we go back to this example, suppose your company has an equity beta of 0.58, the current risk free rate is 6.1%. If the expected market risk premium is 8.6%, what is your cost of equity capital? Okay, so RE would be the risk free rate plus in this case, they had given us the market risk premium, so we can just plug in RPM here and then multiply that by the stock's beta. So in this case, the risk free rate is 6.1%. Market risk premium is 8.6%. That tells you, by the way, that the, the, a stock that has that is equally as risky as the overall market is earning a return of 8.6% higher than what is being earned on the risk-free rate. Now I'm taking that and multiplying that by the stocks beta of 0.58. We can now compute the cost of equity. So we'll take 8.6, multiply that by 0.58, and then add in 6.1. And we get 11.09%. Okay, so that's how you would compute the cost of equity for that company. Now, some advantages and some disadvantages associated with the SML or the CAPM. Now, again, one advantage of the CAPM, CAPM is that it does explicitly adjust for risk. It explicitly adjusts for systematic risk because we include that measure of beta, right? And likewise, every company has a beta measure, okay? Not every company pays out a dividend, but every company will have a beta estimate associated with it, okay? On the disadvantages, you have to come up with some estimate of the market risk premium, which is not stagnant. It varies over time because the change, there are changes to the risk-free rate all the time, and there are changes to the overall return on the market. So the market risk premium will change, therefore it's not stagnant. Likewise, to construct a measure of beta, you need the returns for a company as well as the returns in the market to come up with some measure of beta. And again, those returns will vary over time, so coming up with a measure of beta can be difficult. And oftentimes, we are using past returns to estimate both the market risk premium as well as a historical measure of beta. And again, using past returns to predict the future is not always reliable. Now, going back, 
Suppose our company has a beta of 1.5, the market risk premium is 9%, and the current risk-free rate is 6%. Likewise, we have used our analyst estimates to determine that the market believes our dividends will grow at 6% per year, and our last dividend was $2. Our current stock is selling for $15.65. What is our current cost of equity? All right, so we have all the information now to compute the cost of equity using both approaches, so we can use the dividend growth model, and we also have information we can use to compute the cap M. Let's start out with the cap M here. So if we use the cap M, the return on equity will be the risk-free rate, which is 6%, plus the market risk premium, which is given to us as 9%, and then multiply that by the beta of 1.5. Okay. Likewise, we can also use the dividend growth model to so compute RE. So it will be D1, Okay, so D1 over P0 plus G. Now again, we are not given D1 because we are given the last dividend. The last dividend would be D0. So in this case, we need to take D0, which is $2, multiply it by 1 plus the growth rate of 6%, so 0 0.06. Now that we have the calculation for D1, we can plug in P0, which is 1565. and then add in our growth rate of 6%, so 0 0.06. Okay, so from there we can now estimate both the return on equity or the cost of equity using the CAPM as well as the dividend growth model. So for the CAPM, we'll take the 9%, multiply by 1.5, and then add in the 6. So 19.5%. Is our estimate of the cost of equity for the cap m equation and then for the dividend growth model take two multiply it by one plus 0.06 so that would be 1.06 and then we'll take that divide it by the share price of 1565 and then we'll add in the growth rate of 0.06 and so this comes out to 19.546 so let's call this 19.55 and that's a percent so what is our cost of equity well in this case since you have two different estimates and they're fairly close together i would suggest taking either the midpoint or the average so in this case the overall estimate would be something close to like 19.525 percent okay so oftentimes, if a company is using the CAPM or the dividend growth model to come up with a measurement of the cost of equity, sometimes they'll just use a composite average. All right, and we'll pick up on the next video.